Hi, I'm Janet Cox from 350 Silicon Valley, and I'm really happy to welcome our fabulous panelists and all of you to the last in our series of Climate Week events that we're calling Global Conversations on Finance, Risk, and Investing in a Low-Carbon Future. Um, tonight, what we're going to be talking about is various legislative approaches to decarbonizing the economy. And we have a tremendous, just a wonderful lineup of people for you to listen to. Representative Sean Kasten represents Illinois' sixth congressional district in the western suburbs of Chicago. He's a freshman in the current Congress, where he serves on the House Financial Services Committee, the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis which recently released its long-awaited report, which is a roadmap for reducing U.S. net greenhouse gas emissions by nearly 90% by 2050. He also co-chairs the New Democratic Coalition Climate Change Task Force, and he works in general in the Congress to craft market-based solutions that address the threat of climate change adequately, effectively, and sustainably. Bills he's introduced include the Climate Risk Disclosure Act, which is the House version of Senator Elizabeth Warren's bill in the Senate, the Promoting Grid Storage Act, the Climate Change Financial Risk Act, the Energy Tax Credit Direct Payment Act. He is all over this topic. California State Senator Ben Allen was elected in 2014 to represent a district that includes the west side of Los Angeles County, Hollywood, and coastal South LA communities. Ben serves as chair of the Senate Environmental Quality Committee and is a member of the Senate Committee on Natural Resources and Water. These two, having these two posts make him a major player on environmental policy in California. He also serves on the Senate's Transportation and Governmental Organization Committees and chairs the Select Committee on Aerospace and Defense. He co-chairs the Environmental Caucus and is the chair of the Jewish Caucus. Since coming to the Senate, Ben has championed a diverse array of environmental legislation. He passed the first bill in the nation to define climate-related financial risk and law and require CalPERS and CalSTRS, the two biggest public pension funds in the U.S., to report on that risk in their portfolios. He co-authored the Senate's historic climate change legislation, which requires 50% of the state's energy to come from renewable sources and doubles energy efficiency in buildings by 2030. This past session, he introduced an expansive push to move California away from unsustainable single-use plastic packaging and a state general obligation bond measure to address the impending effects of climate change. New York State Senator Liz Krueger was first elected to the New York State Senate in 2002, and she is the chair of the Senate Finance Committee. A legislative leader on this environmental sustainability, Senator Krueger was central to passing New York State's plastic bag ban and is the lead sponsor of the Fossil Fuel Divestment Act, as well as legislation to repeal $1.6 billion in annual state fossil fuel tax subsidies. Randy Mayle, the political director of the Mass Divest Coalition in Massachusetts, um, represents a broad coalition of unions, faith, climate, and environmental groups, student, faculty, and alumni divestment groups, and business and community organizations. She's actively leading the divestment movement for public pensions with legislation in Massachusetts that has currently awaiting a vote. And she's been instrumental in the our, Ensure Our Future campaign targeting, targeting Liberty Mutual. Randy works to stop the flow of money to fossil fuels from pensions, insurers, asset managers, banks, endowments, subsidies, and bailouts. She has extensive municipal government and political experience as she worked as the Cambridge Recycling Director for 14 years. And in 2018, she was a key staffer for divestment hero Bob Massey in his race for governor of Massachusetts. Randy is exactly the kind of person the movement to move fossil fuels out of the global driver's seat needs. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Caption.
Thanks so much. Um, so the only things we have to do as a country is we have to double our energy efficiency. We have to figure out how to decarbonize those industries that we have no idea how to run without fossil inputs. And then we have to get back to 1985 CO2 emissions. What that means practically, when I say double the efficiency, cut the amount of energy we use per dollar of GDP in half. Not fossil energy, not solar energy, total energy, BTUs per dollar. If we did that, we would get to the level that Switzerland, Germany, Denmark, Japan already are. So we are not technologically limited. We are not skills were limited. We are not financially limited. The, as, you know, as I joke all the time, we don't have to change the laws of thermodynamics, which is good because we can't. We don't have to change the laws of economics, which is good because we can't. We just have to change the laws of the United States. So that's goal one. The second one on the research side is that we don't know how to make fertilizer without natural gas, and I don't know how to feed 9 billion people without fertilizer. We don't know how to make cement without, without fossil inputs. I don't know how to reduce silicon dioxide and turn it into pure silicon so I can make a solar panel without metallurgical coal. These are chemistry problems. Now there's a great R&D opportunity, but we have to invest in the R&D to get there. And then the third piece on 1985 is that getting to zero CO2 by 2050, getting to zero CO2 by 2030 doesn't matter. We got to get there by 1985 because 1985 is the point, if you go back through our entire history as a species, 50% of all the CO2 we have emitted since we first learned how to build fires in a cave was emitted since 1985. And the whole conversation around environmental justice, which is critical, if you believe that what we have to do going forward as a, as a species is to accept the level of wildfires, to accept the level of flooding, to accept the level of hurricanes we now have, and make sure that we invest in moral principles of environmental justice to look out for the least fortunate, we're implicitly making a political bet that for the rest of our time as a species, we will consistently find the political will to funnel resources to the least among us. I'd like to believe that's true, but I think it's more politically likely that we might maybe once in a while find that opportunity. And let's once in a while do that and then make the changes in agricultural practices and yes, probably direct air capture or things like that to get back to 330, 340 parts per million. Now, focusing just on the bills that I've been working on, the, there are tons of opportunities for us to grow our economy by cutting our, by doubling our efficiency. And a lot of that just recalls getting rid of barriers. So I've introduced the Climate Risk Disclosure Act and the, the Climate uh, Financial Risk Act. The, the Climate Risk Disclosure Act would say to the SEC that all companies shall be required to, in a consistent manner, quantify their contribution to a changing climate or their contribution to improving a changing climate. The idea is to normalize so that capital markets can best allocate capital in response to risk. ESG reporting is great, but when every country uses a different type of ESG reporting, it's hard for investors to know what's what. If you compare that to gap financials, you don't get to choose how to report your financial liabilities. There's a single way that everybody does it. And so capital markets respond accordingly. That's what the, the Climate Risk Disclosure Act does. The Climate Financial Risk Act, which I've done with Brian Schatz in the Senate, says that we need to, uh, that we, we will direct the, the, the financial regulators to treat climate change as a systemic risk. We know it is, but they don't treat it that way. So as an example, we know that if we went to zero CO2 globally tomorrow, there's still another, another two feet of sea level rise baked in. We know that that means there is $900 billion of property at risk of loss in the United States. And we know that once that property starts getting lost, the insurance is going to pull out. The secondary mortgage market is going to pull out. We're going to have a huge slew of rippling financial issues. And if we don't get in front of that now by getting the banks to recognize that, put the stress test in like we did after the 2008 financial crisis, then uh, we're going to curse somebody to a massive depression in the future. On the other hand, if we do it now, we'll start to reallocate capital in the markets, move it to safer regions, and in the course of doing that, give us a, give us a safer and more stable future. So um, that's uh, among the things we're pushing. There's a lot more to talk about, but let me stop talking there and turn it over to our guests. Well, thank you for having me on. This is an important panel. 
Um, so I've carried the Fossil Fuel Divestment Act in the New York State Senate for about four years now. And it has been- So Liz, yes. there's, a, there's an echo of some kind. Okay. There's a little bit of a beat going on. And oh. I don't- Oh, you know what? I know why, because my phone was ringing and it was attached. It's on vibrate. <laughs> and it's right by that might've been it. Okay, never mind. Also, also, you're looking a little bit to the left, so you might, do you have a light on your computer? Look okay. at the light. No, so here's the problem. My camera is not on my screen. It's to the left of my screen. So I always have that problem. So I'll try to move my body so that I-, I don't, It'll be fine either way, but Bye. I'm sorry about the noise, but no, start again. Okay, so hopefully there won't Thanks. be the weird vibrating sound. It'll be fine. Okay, let's start again. Thank you for having me as a part of this panel. It's a very important topic to me. I've been carrying as the lead sponsor of the Fossil Fuel Divestment Act for the New York State Legislature for going on four years. And I have a lot of support in both houses, the Senate and the Assembly, but not quite enough to get it over the finish line yet. I came to this issue because I was asked to, to look at the economics of both divestment and of how we could influence the fossil fuel world to stop doing what it was doing. I realized pretty quickly that none of the models to convince fossil fuel companies to change their behaviors based on stockholders advocacy was going to work. After all, if your advocacy is to ask a fossil fuel company to stop being a fossil fuel company, it's not going to work. On the other hand, if you stop investing in fossil fuel companies, you actually choke off their economic ability to bring more fossil fuels up out of the earth, continuing the climate change crisis that we are trying to work so hard to reverse. So it was very clear to me quite quickly that divestment, particularly from pension funds, sent an incredibly powerful message, both to the fossil fuel industry, to other investors, and to the public at large that we were going to do extreme things to try to reverse fossil fuel companies' ability to continue to destroy the earth. So my bill's been modified a number of times over the years in an attempt to gain more support. That's what legislators do. You talk to people and you figure out how you get more support to get your bill passed. And we've also been working closely with the controller's office um, to convince him that he wants to do what we want him to do. And that's the real challenge in New York State, because unlike other states that might have committees or commissions or advisors or the legislature involved in the decisions about their pension funds, in New York State, only one person gets a vote in how our pension funds are invested. And that is the state controller his name is Tom DiNapoli. He's a independently statewide elected official. He's very popular. I personally like him very much and have the highest respect for him. It doesn't mean we agree on everything and we don't agree on this. Um, so our, excuse me, um, our pension fund is called CRF. And so what we're urging through my bill or what we would um, legislate through our bill is that he would he the controller would have to divest the funds from the pension plan that are currently invested in what's called the carbon underground 200 the list of the top 200 oil gas and coal companies we have approximately six billion dollars of our 210 billion dollar pension fund invested in these companies now if we actually attempted to invest from all companies that are producing fossil fuels, it would be about 12 billion, although it's very hard to sort through 
beyond the top 200, so we stop there. The single largest fossil fuel um, company we're invested in is ExxonMobil, and we have about a billion dollars invested in New York State. Now, one of the strongest arguments we have found for talking about divesting pension funds is the realization of what are pension funds. They are funds intended to be there to pay the retirement costs for state workers. So state workers invest in the pension fund and have money invested for them while they work for the state of New York. And we want them to have a good retirement where they have um, fewer financial problems than other retirees because we've made a commitment to them that their pension monies will be there when they need them. So we need to make sure that fiduciarily we are investing correctly for them to get the maximum return with the lowest risk. And that is the job of the controller's office. Here's the dilemma when we're talking about fossil fuels. They are so controversial at this point in history they are so unpopular at this point of history that above and beyond their current return in value, they are at extremely high risk of becoming what's called stranded assets. Their money is through reserves in oil, coal, and gas. That's a significant share of their valuation of the top 200 fossil fuel companies. But to stay within our emissions goals, which in New York State are 80% um, of coal reserves, 50% of gas reserves, and 33% of oil reserves must stay in the ground between now and 2050, it means that we will have to take aggressive action to prevent climate change by not taking any of these reserves out of the ground. That means by definition, the value of these stocks is going to continue to plummet. And it's not hypothetical, it's been happening for already a decade. So there's recent research that shows for New York's common retirement fund, we've already lost more than 260 million in coal investments since 2010. 260 million since 2010, and a recent study estimates the fund is valued at 22.2 billion less than it would have been had it divested from fossil fuels completely. And in 2008, by, since 2008, sorry, let me say that again, sorry, writing over numbers. So if we had divested completely in 2008, the New York Common Retirement Fund would have over $22 billion more available to pensioners across the rest of the portfolio. And these monies would have been invested differently with a better return. So we already believe we can show the answer is divest and secure a better outcome for the pensioners. It's a win-win, you're not trading off one action for another. And we think that's crucial in talking about this and in convincing people that the right answer is to divest from fossil fuels. There's also academic research showing that divestment movement has had a significant impact on companies even when we haven't won the fight yet. So just continuing the educational process of the damage of fossil fuels the future risks, um, highlighting and emphasizing that there should be stigmatization about investing in more fossil fuel activity is actually having an impact on the overall efforts for climate change. When you start talking about this from a leadership perspective, when you push legislation, even if you don't get it passed, you get people waking up to this issue and what the right answer is. And so in fact, even though I have not succeeded in passing this bill in four years now, we continue to work with the controller's office 
And every time we raise a new issue, he actually takes another step to decreasing his investments in fossil fuels and increasing his commitment to environmental, environmental imperatives and increases his financial commitment to green energy. So it's a little dance we're doing while I'm continuing to push this effort. He's continuing to argue that he doesn't disagree with my goals on environmental change, but that he also fundamentally doesn't believe the legislature should be deciding how the pension fund is invested. And I get that. I'm not asking for the legislature to have the power to make determinations over investments with one exception, and that's fossil fuels. Why should we get that one exception? Because we're talking about the end of the earth here um, sooner than later. And so I continue to make the argument on economic grounds, on environmental grounds, on the moral imperative of the state of New York to do the right thing here, while at the same time assuring the controller if he wants to voluntarily do this within the time frame of my legislation, but doesn't want the legislation that I'm perfectly happy to stay with him, stand with him and say, Tom DiNapoli is doing the right thing. We don't need the legislation. We are divesting voluntarily through his office and we're going to get the same outcomes as if we had passed the law. And I know some activists are much more comfortable with a mandate through statute and I get that, I'm a legislator. But if we can't get down that road one way, we can get down that road another way and have the same victory. And again, we've been bringing so many other people along with us by helping to educate them as to why this matters and why we are also protecting the financial future of the retirees of New York State, not putting them at risk. And we even build some scenarios into our bill that allow the um, controller to review specific investments and if he believes that divesting from any specific company would truly put the in the pensions at risk that we give him more time before he divests so we try to build in more flexibility for him to use his fiduciary responsibilities to not take a risk or make a mistake while at the same time moving us out of fossil fuels. And again, based on the research that are coming out more and more frequently, we already know the answer. You don't lose money going out of these stocks. You actually assure that you have an opportunity to use that money in safer types of investments that are not going to become stranded assets by the time any worker in the state of New York needs that money in their pension plan. So we'll continue the fight, we'll continue the education, and it's very exciting to see that there is more and more movement in this direction, state by state, city by city, college by college endowment fund, and in other parts of the world as well. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Congressman Kasten, for the introduction. Thank you uh, for your leadership. And, and um, it's, it's so great to know that we've got such a smart and committed member of Congress fighting for our climate, fighting for the future generations uh, in Washington, DC. And, and uh, we, we need many more of you there. Uh, it's also great to be here with the Senator and, and uh, our friends from Massachusetts. I mean, it's, 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 um, it's good to be part of a group of folks who care so much about trying to do right by future generations and, and try to see what we can do in our own capacities as uh, in our own states to, to make sure that we take up the mantle for, for climate related issues, especially given the vacuum, in fact, the animosity that exists right now uh, amongst the, the folks who are in power in Washington toward doing right by the environment. And um, it's, um, it's amazing to watch you know, the president talk about how he wants you know, pristine water and air and yet you take all these actions to undermine that 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 uh, that agenda 
Um, so anyway, I, I think, you know, obviously everybody on this call knows how much, even in the age of COVID, we need to stand up for our environment and, and that, you know, we really, we, we simply cannot put our efforts on hold to clean our water or our air, uh, tackle the climate or the plastics pollution crisis, even during this health crisis. Uh, it's not as though these environmental problems have patiently waited for us to develop a vaccine before ravaging us with hurricanes and wildfires and all the challenges associated with environmental degradation. So we don't have the luxury of waiting either. Um, you know, here in California, we've experienced the pain associated with climate change very acutely. Um, we had street lamps flickering. These are light sensor uh, street lamps that were flickering on during broad daylight hours uh, in parts of the state because there had been such a deep red shadow as a result of what had already become the worst fire season in state history. And uh, that was, you know, that, that was, that was uh, the, the, the kind of eerie scene that we saw in a, a number of places in California. We now have fires burning everywhere. We already have the worst fire season in history, it seems, even though it's relatively early in the fire season. And we've, uh, we've, we've seen so much of, of beautiful parts of the state, including now wine country, getting so dramatically hit. And I know Janet, you know, we live in Northern California. I know you're, you're experiencing some of this terrible smoke as well. Um, so anyway, no question that, that the pandemic is, you know, on so many levels has shown us that we ignore science at our own peril. Um, you know, with, with climate until at least recently, it was easy to suggest that, you know, there's time to endlessly dis debate the science and disagree with the science. But, um, you know, but if anything is clear, given the COVID crisis, you know, ignoring science, ignoring the data is, uh, uh, you know, the, the results of the inaction can really be immediate and indeed catastrophic. So um, we are seeing the impacts of, 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 of climate inaction and they are catastrophic. It's the fires, it's the storms that we see on the, on the East Coast. So uh, I'm glad to be part of a group of people that actually care about this, that are trying to use our positions of power to do something. Uh, I was proud, I think partly why, part one of the reasons why I'm here is because of the work that I did with Janet and others to get SB 964 passed through the legislature in California. We have these two big pension funds, CalSTRS and CalPERS. California, of course, is such an enormous economy. We have such a powerful economy and, and our, our pension funds, our public employee pension funds are just enormous. They are really huge uh, investment funds. And this bill that we did it requires these two funds to disclose the risk that climate change poses and to, the, to both the value of their fund assets. And also it asks the, the funds to consider the risk, that risk when making decisions, when making their investments. This of course is based on, on some work that was done in, in Europe. And there, there was a recognition of the fact that, you know, that these risks and how to account for them are really becoming important and real. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we've heard, you know, there, we have analysts now projecting that in the coming decades, investments in dirty energy will be far less lucrative than clean energy as nations take the steps needed to slow climate change. And our goal in passing the bill was to ensure that our big fund managers were taking their fiduciary duty to their, you know, to, to the pensioners seriously. Uh, and, and accounting for the impacts that we know will materialize as a result from warming, warming temperatures and all the policy implications, the legal liabilities, stranded assets, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, from our perspective, to do otherwise is worse than denying the truth. It undercuts the faith that we must have in, in our fund managers to do right by both our current and our future uh, pensioners. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that California, with its enormous economy, with these really important pension funds, could continue to play an important leadership role in these burgeoning conversations. I, you know, we're certainly proud of the role that, Cal, you know, the, the role that California played with, with AB and SB 32 in terms of setting new standards for, uh, for, for, for greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we were also taking bold steps in the investment space as well as it relates to, to climate change and going after, uh, after polluters and, and the, the great contributors to, to climate change. Now, I'm, I'm very proud to have authored the legislation. Um, we, you know, quite frankly, Janet knows this, we've, we've been dis disappointed so far to see that the first reports have lacked the detail that we'd hoped for. Uh, I'm certainly grateful to our local activists who are keeping up the public pressure and following this so closely. We really got to continue to hold the funds accountable. And I do want to thank some of the board members, like our state, uh, our state controller, Betty Yee, and others who have really asked some of the aggressive questions that, that need to be asked to hold these funds accountable. I think we recognize that you know, this, 
this bill, SB 964, is just one small step in the larger march toward climate justice that so many of us have, have been participating in. We recognize, though, how important this is. Um, so just, just this last week, Governor Newsom, uh, we're proud to say, uh, sign an executive order that will phase out the sale of internal combustion engines in our cars by 2035. And I think a lot of us in the environmental space are really excited about this. This is going to redu reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 35 percent, uh, toxic NOx emissions by 80 percent from California's transportation sector. So that's super important. Our Air Resources Board, which of course has been tasked with the implementation of so much of our climate change policy, will develop regulations to mandate that all operations of medium and heavy duty vehicles will be 100% zero emission by 2045, where feasible, uh, with the mandate going into effect by 2035 for, uh, for drayage trucks. And so this is gonna help California move forward to green and decarbonize the vehicle fleet. Now we've got, I think, 15 other countries around the world that have already uh, committed to phasing out gasoline powered vehicles. Now we're joining them, hopefully, you know, this all kind of comes together and it, it survives legal challenge. Um, the executive order, of course, lays the groundwork for future legislative strategy to formally end fracking in the state of California as well. Um, and, and of course, we're, I think the legislature is going to have to step up. We also, we already have several legislators who I'm working with that have come forward with, with proposed legislation to kind of effectuate much of, of what is in this executive order. So I'm certainly excited to be working with my colleagues. I'm excited to be working with the Newsom administration to move um, these new policies forward. I mean, it, it's, it, the stakes are so high uh, uh, for, for the future. And, um, you know, we just all, as we, as we watch with some degree of despair, uh, the national debate, it is so important for those states that actually have a certain degree of consensus on these kinds of environmental matters, on matters of climate, for those of us in our legislatures, for those of us in state government, for those of us in the activist class who have connections to state government to continue to be aggressive, to keep pushing the envelope, to keep trying to, to ensure that, that even if the, the federal government isn't taking action, that our states, particularly those states that have the power, the size, the might, both economic and political, uh, of, 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 like the state of California, like the state of New York, like Massachusetts, step up and play a leadership role. So, so happy to be part of this discussion. Big thanks to you, Janet, for your continued activism and, and, and support and, and engagement on this on this work and looking forward to a, a great panel discussion. Uh, now I turn it over to uh, Randy Mayo um, from Mass to Vest. My, uh, my, uh, my wife's home state is Massachusetts. We lived there for a long time. Looking forward to your comments, Randy. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and it's great to follow um, uh, Senator Kruger's comments. You laid out the case, all the cases for divestment. Um, and thank you to the organizers and all the other uh, panelists. This is a really great honor to be speaking with you and alongside elected officials. So I wanna give a shout out for our, our Massachusetts um, legislators that have led this uh, fight for us. Um, this session, state reps Dylan Fernandez and Jay Livingstone and our state Senator uh, Mark Pacheco have led um, on the bill that I'll be talking about today. Um, but Mass Divest is a state coalition working to divest pension funds. And we've been around since 2013. And we've, you know, we've done a lot of different, we've had a lot of different attempts to passing legislation. And so where we are today is because of the history of what's gone on in Massachusetts to try to attempt to um, get the authority to do this for localities and also to require the state pension. Um, so in Massachusetts, we have the state pension fund, which I believe is about $70 billion. And then we have about 104 separate city and county level pension funds. Some of them have their money with the state. Some of them have their independence and they manage their own money. And so for many sessions, we tried to require PRIM, which is the state pension. It's the Pension Reserves Investment Management Board. Um, we tried to require PRIM to divest from fossil fuels, including coal, oil, and gas. And uh, that did not make it successfully through the legislature several times. And um, at the same time, the city of Somerville, which is just north of Boston, tried to divest in 2017. And there was a state regulatory agency that made them reverse their divestment. They moved nine and a half million dollars out of a fossil fund 
And the state said, what are you doing? Move it back. And so Somerville uh, filed a home rule petition in the state government that didn't move forward because there was 104 systems like them and the legislature said, we don't wanna set a precedent for everyone having their own home rule. And so we took that as constructive feedback and guidance. And so we came back with this, you know, home rule petition for all bill, basically, what we call the local option um, this session. And uh, that's what I wanna talk about more today. So this local option isn't a mandate. It provides the option to local um, independent retirement systems to divest from fossil fuels if they choose so, you know, at Mass Divest, we think of this campaign as a three phase process and we're just in phase one after, you know, many, many years. Phase one is to get this authority to divest. Phase two is to recruit and educate the retirement boards to do the right thing. And then phase three is to get them to actually implement it. And at the same time, we're trying to think about how we can bring the state pension along. Um, so, you know, and I, and I want to just say, I, I'm really passionate about fossil fuel divestment. I think that it's particularly an effective strategy because pensions, as some may know, are really the largest category of investor in the world. Insurance is next. And so I've been working on both pensions and insurance. And um, I, I'm a pensioner. I worked for the city of Cambridge, as Janet mentioned. And, you know, there's, there's over 100,000 people in Massachusetts who have dedicated years of their life as public servants. And I think it's really important that um, we're able to have, depend on those pensions when we retire. Um, you know, and for me, though, I had a really aha moment when Rex Tillerson, CEO of ExxonMobil was appointed secretary of state. That really shocked me. And when I thought about why, it was like follow the money was flashing in my mind. So. Um, the divestment bill in Massachusetts would really pave the way, open, unlock the door, and get, get um, the ability for localities to divest. Um, and we've done a lot of different things um, throughout the state, throughout the years. Um, we've educated retirement boards. We've filed legislation. We've held lobby days. We've gotten municipal resolutions passed. There's over a dozen municipalities throughout the state that have um, stated formally that they support fossil fuel divestment. Um, and we've organized the briefings and, and testimony at the state house. And I should note that the former comptroller of New York State, Tom Sanzillo, who's uh, finance director for IEFA, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, has come to Massachusetts to testify in front of our legislature um, on behalf of the financial case for divestment, which um, as many of the other panelists have talked about, is you can't argue with it. At this point, you know, Tom Sanzillo has said, the question isn't whether we should divest, but why are we still invested in the first place at this point? Because when you look at those graphs, comparing the energy sector to the overall S&P um, 500 performance, energy is down over the past 10 years, whether it's coal, oil, and even gas. And in one of the sessions this week, we, we learned that um, fracked gas has never been profitable. So these are not um, low risk uh, investments and our pensions should be low risk um, at this point. So one of the things that I wanted to note um, with what we've done in Massachusetts is we looked at the Somerville Retirement Board and their portfolio, how, you know, we asked the question, how would it have performed if they were allowed to remain divested in 2017? And in November 2019, we did this analysis and we found that they would have achieved 5% higher growth. I just want to let that sit for a minute because 5% more on a portfolio is nothing to, um, that, you know, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal, 5%. If they were, allowed to remain divested. We had the COVID pandemic um, force prices down um, and demand down in the oil markets and other fossil fuels. And so we updated our analysis in April of this year. 
And even in these uncertain times, divestment would have been good for Somerville's portfolio. And so we put that on the table and we passed, um, you know, our bill H4440, which is our local option bill, has passed um, through two out of three committees in the House. And right now the status of our bill is that it is on what's called orders of the day, which we think is a really good place to be at this point. It's basically the to-do list um, for the House of Representatives in Massachusetts. Um, and so this bill would enable about 70 of the 100 and plus retirement systems at the city and the county level to divest if they chose to from fossil fuels. Um, as I mentioned, the rest have given control of their assets to the state pension. So, and we have a lot of support for the bill throughout the legislature. We have legislators from every county in Massachusetts co-sponsoring this bill. Um, it, and fossil fuel divestment in general has been endorsed by public sector unions, many locals of SCIU, the Nurses Association, Mass Teachers Association, Boston Teachers Association, and a lot of important climate groups in Massachusetts, including um, Mass Power Forward, Sierra Club, and Mothers Out Front, and others. Um, so, and, and divestment has, you know, this is kind of the case that we make to legislators, but there's many organizations within the state that have divested, including the University of Massachusetts, which is a state school. Um, they divested in 2016, the first major public university to, to divest. So um, what's important right now is that we keep the pressure on and we keep organizing. The pandemic lockdown um, created a situation where the legislative session, which should have ended in July, has now been extended in Massachusetts through the end of the year. So our goal is to get the House Speaker and the House leadership to bring H4440 to a vote. Um, and, and then we'll take it from there. We think that the Senate um, will be supportive. We have a very progressive Senate. And so getting this through the House is something that we've been working really hard on. And if you know anybody who lives in Massachusetts, I'm gonna throw a link in the chat here. Um, ask them to urge their rep to um, urge this, the House Speaker to bring this bill to a vote. Um, it's possible and we're, we're so close and this is a really important step in Massachusetts that we can protect pensions um, and at the same time join the leadership across the country that is, that is recognizing that now is the time. And actually, as uh, Rep. Kasten said, we're way overdue. We should, have, we should have done this a long time ago. So we have to take this action and I'm excited to uh, join the discussion and, and talk more with everybody. So um, I will pass the mic back to uh, Rep. Kasten. Well, Thank thanks, you. Randy. I, I know we got some questions in the Q&A and I know we're limited on time, but I want to take just a little bit of a prerogative to, to put one question out that, that just sort of sitting here and thinking about what you're all saying. I'm, uh, I, I should first confess that I am, I am a demand cider. Um, and, and by that, I joke with my colleagues all the time that the one thing that energy, drugs, and sex all have in common is that we always try to regulate demand by, by trying to influence supply. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it has mixed results, um, to put it mildly. But, but I want to, I, I think, I totally agree with you, Randy, and I think all of you have said that there is this enormous opportunity in the pensions because that pensions, endowments, insurance companies, like this is where the cash, you know, wealthy families, this is where the cash is in our economy. Part one of that question is, where should it divest from? Part two of that question is, where should it invest? And one of the things that I think we struggle with in Washington that I'm curious how you think about is that we have been talking about the problem in the wrong way. Almost everything we can do to lower, the, to lower CO2 emissions also lowers the cost of energy. A solar panel doesn't use fuel. A Tesla doesn't use gasoline. Um, efficiency in your home you know, saves energy. And there is a, for the, for the foreseeable future, there is long-term downward pressure in the value of useful energy, not fossil energy, but heat and electricity and 
motive force. And I think there's a really, ch there's a, a huge challenge coming if we don't think about it, that we are, we are essentially depressing the investment thesis in clean energy because we have been so successful, right? Um, if, if, you know, the whole electric grid dispatches to the marginal cost generator, if every generator on the electric grid has zero marginal cost, what's the price of electricity? And we've actually seen over the last 15 years, the US grid went from 1300 pounds a megawatt hour to 950, and the price of power has fallen by almost 7%. That's making it harder and harder to invest. So as you all think, set divestment to the side. What can we do federally or at the state level to make sure that we still, we, we, there's this tension, right? We've, we've essentially crafted a model where 100% of the, of the economic benefit of clean energy flows to consumers. And how do we make sure that enough of that benefit remains that investors still have a thesis to invest? Have you, have you, how, do you, how do you talk to your boards once you've divested? Where do you put it? And how do you justify that investment thesis when the value of energy for the foreseeable future is going to keep falling? Well, I might add the demand for energy continues to grow um, as we are also making energy cheaper. And I'm not sure, but I will start to think about that. Are we in a world where there's really no opportunities for investors in sustainable and new clean forms of energy? Or have we had just an overheated, overpriced universe in the economy of what we all spend and even think we can get returns on um, because the costs of fossil fuels have proved to be so high. I happen to live in Manhattan Island and proudly represent it. And suddenly the housing market is actually becoming cheaper because at the moment people don't have money, they're not sure they wanna be in New York City, et cetera. Some people think that means the world is coming to an end. I see it as an incredible opportunity to finally get some affordable housing in my city and to recognize we did have an overheated real estate market and people need to ask hard questions about is that a good or a bad? And you're right, if you own real estate property, you probably think it's a bad. Um, but as a public policy um, discussion, I actually think these things are in our best interest. So I would want to sort of go back, challenge you that I'm not sure lowering the cost of energy with new sustainable models um, that is actually a bad. I would also, as a regulator and a government person, I'm really interested in government owned utilities. That's a whole other discussion, I know, but there are actual ways that government can be the investor, so to speak, in their own utilities, lower costs, keep sustainable moving forward. And so maybe we won't be the Exxon of non-fossil fuels, but I don't think government needs to be. It needs to have enough of a return to keep the utilities going. Um, but there's a lot of communities throughout this country who have started to ask really hard questions about would we be better off if it wasn't privately held, if the utility companies weren't privately held. Maybe you didn't want to go down that road, but I think it's worth raising. So, so I actually I actually ran, um, um, I, I briefly ran a, a lightly regulated utility in New York State and the New York State Public Service Commission did a wonderful job of helping us craft a model and that's a whole separate conversation. But I think there is there are two separate questions around Markets have proven to be extremely effective at dispatching existing assets, um, but they've, we haven't really found a good market-based way to build new assets. And what I think is interesting is this question about the, we, you know, when we, did, and I, I've spent more of my life building energy assets than I have as a member of Congress, but we would have all these interesting conversations with pension funds, with endowments, where they would say, we have a mission to do something positive, but we also have a return we have to hit. And there was inevitably a dead band between the things they would do for charitable mission reasons and the things that they would do for return. And a lot of clean energy ended up in that dead band 
to the point that there's a there's a common saying in the power industry that everybody loves to be everybody wants to be the third owner of a power plant because the first owner goes bankrupt the second owner you know has to sell down to the Nasdaq and the third guys make a lot of money because if you have a good asset you can own it but the but the it, it, I'm, I'm talking too long. Let me, let me open up because I know we've got some questions in the Q&A and I know we've got not much time left. Um, geez, I'm trying to see if anybody addressed the questions to anybody specifically. Let me give this one to Ben because there's a California one. How do you divest in a state like California while also preparing for a just transition of fossil fuel industry workers? Oops, there we go. Okay, yeah, um, that's that's a, that's a that's that's the question on everybody's minds uh, all over the country, um, and and of course I think everybody knows that that you know we've we're all now in this kind of uncomfortable place where uh, at least on some of this stuff we're we're finding ourselves um, in conflict with uh, you know traditional Democratic Party allies in the building trades unions. Um, you're certainly seeing a lot of that at play right now all over the state of California and Los Angeles, and I, and I know elsewhere in the country. Now, I will say, you know, that there's so much job growth in the green sector, you know, uh, that, that there's, there's, there are opportunities there. I think, if anything, it's about making sure that as we, as we you know, put this transition in place, that we make sure that the jobs that are being created are are good jobs that are going to leave people in a strong place where they can build a you know a good a good life for themselves and for their families. Um, so, but I don't I don't see anything that's antithetical to our broader agenda. There's going to be a lot of jobs required. I mean, Joe Biden talks about this all the time. When he thinks climate change, he thinks jobs, right? And so there, there's some real job creation opportunities. The key thing here is, you know, are we going to make sure that those jobs are are good jobs? And I think that's 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 our one of our many responsibilities. Now, of course, a lot of the utilities that we're tasking with this transition already have uh, you know strong relationships with labor unions, for example, and others, and they're they're able to do it. But I know there's a lot of there's a lot of concern about a more unregulated solar sector, for example, that um, that that you know isn't quite as committed to to the, the type of of quality jobs that the traditional fossil fuel sectors have been. So. This is a this is a challenge. Now, look, I mean, in our state, we've got a very strong commitment to fighting climate change. We also have a very strong labor movement and a very strong um, you know, group of folks in, in our building trades. And so, this is something we're kind of bashing heads over a little bit right now. And I, I think we're going to come up with something that everyone can feel good about. But you know, it does. Um, maybe that'll drive up. Um, you know, the cost a little bit for you, Sean. I know you want, you want higher. <laughs> I don't want higher costs. I'm just wondering how you deal with lower costs. The, I, you know, one of the things, Ben, and I, I think we can stipulate that every economic transition we've gone to through our history, I mean, look, converting to a green economy is replacing a 1950s amortized infrastructure with a 2020s needs to be invested infrastructure. And that by definition is gonna mean modernization and productivity growth and all that goes with that. And, and I think sometimes we cripple ourselves in the green industry that we say that, you know, even though, you know, when Goldman Sachs fired a bunch of traders and replaced them with algorithms, nobody said, oh, what are we going to do for this, to smooth the transition for these, <laughs> these traders? But, you know, we burden ourselves with it. But even if you stipulate that we will create more jobs than we destroy, you still have the hard question of what you say to an oil worker in Bakersfield who's been working and is 55. And I, th I think there's something very, pa very sort of paternalistic about saying, why don't you just go back to community college and learn how to do thin film deposition so you could work at a solar plant, right? Yeah. And they're sort of like, what, what's good in aggregate for the economy and how you affect the individual lives that are at play. Well, what have you seen, Congressman, out there that you think offers a good path for us? in this if i if i had the answer i wouldn't ask the question i'd just tell you how to solve it i mean i i you know i like you know i i think the i think when i've talked to labor unions they will they will both acknowledge that green jobs is a good way to sell the transition and that there is something very paternalistic about saying you can just shuffle over and you know and i think at some level i you know i tell people like the the industrialization of agriculture gave us massive increases in food, massively lower food prices, 
but you would have to be a complete heathen not to acknowledge that the second half of Ma Jode's life was a lot tougher than the first half of her life, right? And so there's, you know, so there's, you know, we can, I think, I think the economists tend to look at the aggregate creative disruption, you know, Joseph Schumpeter is a great thing, but it's those individual lives that are at play. And what do you do with those individual lives? And, and how do we make sure that there's a, there's a cushion that's not just telling people to go back to school, right? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I mean, I, of course, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that there's a whole new set of, gen there's a new generation coming up that we need to train in that dir in, in a better direction. And, and that, I mean, I know we've got, I know, I think there are more solar jobs in California than there are coal jobs in the entire United States. So, um, so you're right. I mean, we can't, we have, and look, I mean, I don't represent a, an area with a lot of fossil fuel jobs. So it's easy for me to say this. I get that. I get that. And I certainly don't want our your colleagues to lose seats in you know, other parts of the country because we're seen, uh, you know, at least on the pro-environment, more democratic side as being too paternalistic. So um, uh, I, I think at the end of the day, in the end of the day, Congressman, we're not actually, we're not asking for, we're not turning off the light all of a sudden. We're transitioning, right? Yeah. It's, about, it's a transition. So, you know, the, fo the, the older gentleman who's working at, a, at an oil rig in, in Bakersfield, they're, they're going to they're gonna be able to keep working on oil for the rest of his life. Let, let, let's be real here. We're not gonna stop oil production tomorrow. We're, we're, we're basically transitioning people away. So those folks will be able to continue doing their work, but as we train the next generation to start doing cleaner work. Let, let me, uh, just your comment on coal. I like to remind people all the time that the US employs more bakers than coal miners, but I've never seen a politician who films a campaign ad in front of a bunch of men and pastry chefs covered in flour. Um, but that's the reality. I think we got time for one one more question. Um, uh, the I want to make sure we get to everybody. Randy, there's there's one here that says, "What do you what have you found more persuasive, the climate carbon argument or the declining economics of the fossil fuel industry argument?" I would say the latter. Um, you know, for our situation, we have really focused on. Um, you know, the charts. I mean, we're talking to fiduciaries, but people who are in. Um, control of assets. Their job is to maximize returns. And originally, the response from the legislature has been, well, and the reason why they're saying we need a law in the first place is because they're, they regarded this as a social concern and that the legislature would have to uh, intervene and, and, you know, follow statutory requirement that was created with, um, you know, in the 80s, when there was when there was rules passed saying that they had to divest from companies operating in South Africa because of apartheid, there was a precedent with tobacco, um, and there was a precedent with arms sales to Ireland. Actually, those three things are on the books in Massachusetts, and so the social argument pushed us towards this frame of you need legislation. But the fact is that this is no longer. Um, and really has never been if you look at the last 10 years of the market performance that we talked about. So yeah, finan the financial argument has been the most compelling way to get legislators to um, be supportive of this that were, or weren't already on our side. Um, you know, there were progressives in, in the legislature that um, were on top of this because they see it as part of the climate suite of bills. Um, but we had a lot of very deep and specific conversations with our chair of the Committee for Public Service, um, uh, you know, Rep. Um, Jerry Paracella from Beverly, Mass. And we talked about the financials and that was really important to him. And, you know, I remember the moment when we, when, when we really made the case that the Somerville um, portfolio would have done 5% better had they been allowed to remain divested. And that was almost case closed for him. When he understood that, it was like, well, then what are we doing here? Um, but, and, and I would say too, that within the climate community, there have been priorities along the lines of 100% renewables and all of the, you know, things that we need to do that uh, Rep. Kasten is talking about. And, and divestment doesn't fit neatly in the, that um, framework. And so we've been operating as kind of a secondary priority for the climate community. Um, but just to go back real quick to in the invest question, 
at least tactically in Massachusetts, we've decided to not, um, at least up until this point, not have advocacy for renewables as part of our divestment campaign because we really want the fiduciaries to see that we respect that that's their job. That's what they should be doing is identifying what is going to uh, maximize returns. And, you know, what we've been told and I understand is that the energy sector, you know, wind and solar isn't really coded in the energy sector when it comes to the market, they're con considered technology. So there's different, there's different categories there. And, you know, just looking at, I mean, it was a great moment last week, I think it was, or two weeks ago when Exxon got kicked out of the Dow Jones. Um, and for 92 years, they were in the Dow Jones. And so what it was replaced, you know, what, who replaced them? It was Salesforce. That's a technology company. So, you know, there have been legislators that say, oh, I think we should divest from fossil fuels. We should probably invest in, in cannabis. You know, whatever is going to make retirees money that's socially responsible, I think that the investments in renewables are, shouldn't be viewed right now as, you know, that they should be profitable because it's an investment in our future. Like libraries don't have to be profitable and the recycling program shouldn't have to be profitable. You know, when I was running the recycling program in Cambridge, no one ever asked the trash guys if their program was, you know, revenue positive. There's so many things that we do that we shouldn't have to view it through that lens, especially when we're in this investment um, ramp up phase. But um, I, ho I hope that helps. Well, actually, it brings us right back to the core conversation in this area, which is about fiduciary duty. And you've just crystallized it, I think, Randy. Um, I, uh, we're five minutes over. Um, I want to thank everybody. Actually, there are two questions I want to read here. Um, and then we'll try to hang on with our panelists for just a minute. Um, Caitlin Marshall says, thank you to all the panelists for sharing your time tonight. My question, in my little tiny state of Maine, the argument of pension divestment is just a drop in the bucket is amplified. So how do you get people excited about divestment? When we're choosing a campaign to focus on among all the ways to tackle climate change, why this? And I'm not sure we have time to get into this, but I want to say, Caitlin, if you talk to me or you talk to Randy or you talk to both of us, I think we can convince you that it's not a bad idea. Um, and th thanks for the question. It's a good one. Uh, another person says, Liz Kruger, I was really liking what you were saying about not wanting the next non-fossil fuel Exxon. Not everyone has a pension or any money in the stock market. How do we make sure market-based solutions benefit the majority of people, not just not, not those just lucky enough to own pensions or stocks. And that gets back, I think, to the points that Ben was making and the larger question of, you know, how do we transition into something that really works for well, everyone? Certainly, um, certainly in the discussion of divestment from pension funds, you're only talking about one universe of divestment, um, which is, you know, a market-based system for those people who are lucky enough in our state, in our country, to have any kind of pension plan at all. It's a much bigger discussion that we should be having, but not tonight. Why isn't every worker in this country able to get some kind of pension plan to ensure that they do not end their lives um, in poverty? And that's a it's a huge question that I don't think we, we can take on tonight. But again, I think part of the answer is what I was saying with maybe you don't, and it's, it's pretty much what Randy would just said. You don't look at everything through a market lens. I think that utilities should be evaluated in the context of this is not just a social good, this is a necessity for life. So, you know, when you're talking about one, saving the planet, a necessity for life, and two, making sure people have access um, to electricity and heat and transportation. Those are also necessities and maybe they need to be dictated by 
um, broader government controls than we normally think of in this country as being, you know, the bailiwick of government. So I was never big about decontrolling the energy sector decades ago. I don't think it did us much of a favor. And maybe in the context of green, new energy, we should be exploring um, having a bigger role for government in that, which will also will help to protect people who don't necessarily have money to gain or lose in some stock-driven pension plan. If I can just jump in real quick. You know, one other thing that I wanted to mention is, you know, at some point we should, you know, we should total how much money the coal, oil, and gas industries have gotten from government in the form of subsidies and bailouts and everything over the course of their entire history. Because I don't really think that that's an industry that we can um, determine has been successful on their own um, merits. And even if we look at defense, I think that I look at that as a, as a form of a, sub, a subsidy to the fossil fuel industry. So um, we need to look at the green, green economy and clean energy in the same way. If we want them to succeed, um, they need a leg up and they, they can't compete against uh, these industries that have been so intertwined with handouts. So over to you, Representative Kasten. Do you think you can sell that idea? <laughs> I think it's exactly right. Thank you, Randy. Um, well, it, you know, one of my and and I'm you know I'm new to this line of work. I've I've spent more time more time as an entrepreneur by a factor of about eight than I have as a member of Congress. Um, when I used to, I used to run some clean energy trade associations. And one of the things that we would joke about when I was on that side of the conversation and is now more painful in this one is that there is one constituency that never ever comes to Washington. And that is the constituency for economic efficiency. Because nobody says, you know what I want? I, 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 want, my, I want my industry to be more competitive. I want the world to be easier for my competitors. I want there to be fewer barriers to entry. I want it to be fewer barriers to exit. I want more transparency of my price. I mean, these are all like Adam Smith 101 stuff, right? And the, and I think we all as legislators, or not just as legislators in any line of work, we have an obligation to think about who's not in the room and make sure we're advocating for them. And on the one hand, I think politically that's, that becomes difficult because removing, removing existing incentives to, you know, to incumbent powers is politically hard. But it's also an amazing opportunity because the, what that means wow. is that we have enormous opportunities to profitably reduce greenhouse gas emissions to create tremendous wealth just by taking the emergency break off, right? And I, and I think that becomes a conversation that, that I think we've, we've not had, and when I say we, I mean, I mean the activists, not the legislators. We've, we've framed this whole conversation as if you can either be good for the environment and bad for the economy or good for the economy and bad for the environment. And somewhere along the way, we've, we've just avoided the fact that like I said, everything we do to lower CO2 emissions lowers our cost of energy. Nobody in the energy world wants lower cost energy. It's a bummer. But the consumers love it. And, you know, as a, as a farmer once told me who'd converted to organic farming, he said, you know, my, he said, my revenue's down, but it's the amount of money that stays in your pocket that matters. And my expenses are down farther. <laughs> and that's true for our economy too, right? And I, th and I think as long as we frame it that way, people come around. And I, and I don't say that just out of some purely academic perspective. I built 80 clean energy projects. Every single one of them was at least twice as efficient as the US electric grid. Every single one of them used technologies that was at least 50 years past the date of its patent expiring. And with one exception, not a one of them was ever sold because anybody but me gave a damn about climate. 
it was because we figured out, we put the deal together. And then I went to our customers and I said, all right, I found a way to save you a bunch of money. And I've decided I'm going to keep 100% of the savings. <laughs> they say, no, no, I want some of the savings. All right, we'll have a negotiation. Oh, by the way, we're going to cut CO2 a lot as well. But, but you frame it in terms that people value and you can get things done. And I think we have an opportunity there and we're, and goodness knows we have the urgency to put that to work. So let's, let's go get it done. On that note, thank you all. And thanks to all of our participants out there in the ether. Um, we will be sending a round of videos of this and the other um, presentations in our series. And we just, it's clear that this conversation needs to keep going. And I just think it's a gift to all of us to be able to hear the four of you talking about this from different parts of the country, different parts of the government, different political orientations. It's really helpful. And I think we should do more of it. So with that, um, we're going to stop recording and with the panelists stay on for just a second. And we'll um, thank everybody. <laughs>